Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Brothers in Arms, a new way for men to talk. I am your host, comedian Edgar Rivera, and I'm joined today by my brothers, Dr. Dan Ratner, comedian Eric Nieves, and coming back again for a second week in a row, my very good friend, Rob Davon Butler. I had to, I've been practicing your name all day. I've been calling him Davin for like forever. <laughs> the Latino in me was like, no, nah, it's Davon. No, it's Day. Davon Butler. What's up, Rob? What's up, baby? You got it right this time, man. I'm, I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want everybody to know that this is very hard for me. If you listen to the podcast, you know I will mess up the English language, but it's the, the good thoughts that come out of me, man. Dr. Dan, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm really glad to be back here. Um, you know, Rob, it was such a pleasure having you last week. Uh, it just felt like you fit right in. So we were just like, just come back. Come back yeah. right away. <laughs> I love it. That's it. He just got another job. He doesn't even know it. <laughs> he got a promotion. As long as his wife don't get no job interviews. We got Rob. And what's up, Eric? How are you, buddy? I'm good, man. Dr. Dan, good to see you. Rob, I'm really glad that you're back. And Edgar, you don't ruin the English language. You season it with adobo and it just comes out Spanish. That's what yes. <laughs> you... <laughs> I realize that the, the, you know what's crazy that I sound really good when I really have a heavy accent. Like if I if I talk like this all the time, I sound really good. But you know, I try to be Americanized because of Dr. Dan, and it just messes up at times. <laughs> it's all <Aww>. for me. <laughs> Why are you pinning that on Dr. Dan? He's like, what I, I do? <laughs> But I'm happy, man. I'm happy to be here, brothers. Uh, this week for me was very hard. I was just moving this week, so I moved into a new place, and you know how hard that is, man. As a guy, I don't know, maybe you guys could relate with me. Um, I hate when people ask me to move, help them move, you know? I'm that dude that I would not ask another man to help me move because I know one day that man might move, and it's going to make me feel guilty, you know? Like like Rob offered last week, but then he disappeared. I don't know what happened. He, he had a football. Oh. <laughs> You had me at movie. I was ready to do some lifting. You start talking about painting. I was like, no, no, I wasn't gonna have you paint. So I move. I'm finally in my new setup in my new place, and I'm happy to be here, man. I'm happy to be back here with our wonderful show, Brothers in Arms, man. So Ed Edgar, quite quite honestly, if you if you want to avoid helping friends move, pick friends that live out of state. Okay. If you yes. notice, I love you guys. The one thing you all have in common is that you live out of state. So you I don't have to state. help you move at all. I could, I'll call you and tell you how I feel bad that you're moving, but I, I, I live in New York. So, <laughs> you know, listen, that, that's the plan. You gotta do that, make your friends I even thought about calling Eric. I said, hey Eric, I'm moving this weekend, man. You know, you know yeah, okay. it's just a flight, yeah. man. JetBlue has specials. I would have moved to a new chair to feel bad about you. That's about it. You know, <laughs> nice, man. So let's get on with the show, man. Dr. Dan, you wanna bring us into this wonderful segment we like to call Old news, maybe from yesterday. That's right, because no news is really old. It's just, you know, been told before. But uh, last week I concentrated on a lot of statistics and numbers on the negative things that happen when kids grow up without a father. You know, and, you know, it, we needed to talk about it, but it was real serious. So I wanted to bring up some of the positive numbers, you know, when we talk about fathers and what we're learning in studies. Like uh, uh, right now, fathers, we, they're getting older and having less kids. I found that interesting. Right now, the average age of a father is 27 years old with one child. And in the late 80s, it was 25 years old was the average age, and they had 2.1 children. So they had more children, and they had them younger. Um, but there's been change generationally. Uh, research has shown that dads in this generation spend three times as much time with their kids as dads did two generations ago. So... The fathers of today are spending three times more with their kids than grandpa spent with their dad. So there's been a leap in that. Um, they did a, a survey of uh, uh, millennials and uh, Gen X dads, and 86% of them said they work hard at becoming a better parent. And at first I thought that was a good stat, and I'm like, what happened to the 14%? Like, there's 14% of you that are like, I'm good? It should be 100%. Um, <laughs> And this, this killed me. You know, people always say, I've heard because I don't have kids. People tell me that kids take years off your life. You hear that all the time. But they did, they did a study in Sweden, 2017, of fathers over the age of 60. And they found that, uh, that having a kid actually added two years to your life expectancy. So all the parents that were yelling at the kids saying, you're killing me, you're lying. You're making them live two years longer. Now, I don't know <laughs> if it's per kid or it's kids in total. So I don't know, Dan. You might only get four, Rob might get eight, but I'm just saying that they did the study and that's what they found out. But this one number I wanted to bring up, and I hope we can talk about this a little bit. 
is, uh, you know, fatherhood, it should be a choice. I think parenthood should be a choice, or you would, in most uh, occurrences, you would think it is a choice. But 45% of pregnancies in this country are unintended or unplanned. So that means only 55% of women reported the pregnancies were something they wanted to do, they were planning on having a child. And, you know, if you look at uh, you, the use of birth control, it's not 100%. And it's been shown in studies that even if you use condoms 100% of the time, two out of 100 women can, will, will get pregnant per, you know, uh, per, at that ratio. Two out of 100 women will become pregnant even if a condom's being used. And that kind of takes the choice away from the man that put on the condom in that he did everything I thought he thought he was supposed to do to not become a father, but yet he still has a chance to become one. I just thought that was interesting. Really? Really fascinating num numbers across the board. And um, first of all, I do agree with you. 86% at first at first glance, you're like, oh, good job. I know. No, not good job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like there's 14% of them going, I'm good, man. I got this. I'm, yeah. You know, come on. And the I funny thing like is that 14% that, that, that says they're good, they're the worst. There's no, <laughs> there's no question. Mm -hmm. I could imagine, yep. You know, Eric, I know one of the things you you wanted to talk about was this idea of choice. You you chose not to have kids, so I certainly understand, you know, from a personal perspective how you think about it. And um it is it is really interesting to think about one of the things that I thought we might talk about some is uh the pressure to have kids. Like there's a there's an expectation I think that's sometimes brought to people of oh, you are supposed to have kids. And supposed to by a certain time. And I actually think the fact that the numbers are gravitating towards parents being a little bit older when they have kids. One of the things that's speaking to is that I think people are feeling more resilient to say, no, I am going to make the choice. I'm going to choose when I'm ready. Rob, what, what's your take on this? I, 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 I agree with you 100%. So I think as I was taking notes as you were speaking, Dr. Dan, I think finances play a, a key role in one's ability to, to, to feel like they can provide for a child. The other thing is marriages. I bet there's a correlation between the marriage age and marriage rate. I bet people are getting married older now at a much lower rate. And so when you don't have that nuclear family structure, the idea of being a non-custodial father, potentially having to pay child support, is disadvantageous. The other thing I think is happening is we become even more individualistic in this age than any other age that that came before it is people are, are more inherently selfish. It's what, what do I want to do? Uh, pe people are, you see it even in religion, people are detaching themselves from these identities based on gender roles and what, what our parents and grandparents did. It's like, what do I believe? What what do I think is fun? What kind of life do I want to live? And let me get comfortable in attacking and building, manifesting that before I start bringing other people into my situation. So I think the combination of those things are driving what we see. And quite frankly, I'm here for it. I, 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 I'm here for it. I got a 22 year old daughter, a 19 year old son. I'm like, no, 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 no. When you talk about marriage and kids, think 30s, not 20 and 21 like your mother and I think down the road you got to go explore be your find out who you are find out why you're here find out what makes you happy find out um you know what are your non-negotiables like you you have to live a little so I'm with you e? yes so you said um that um fathers now they are there for their kids three times more than than back in the days Eric that's what you're yeah saying, in, like in, in the sheer just the sheer amount of time that they've that they spend with their children it's been calculated that it's three times the amount of time uh, that there was that they spent two generations ago which means that 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 you know that kid's grandfather is getting like three times more attention than his dad got from his father and which was probably mm -hmm. a, a side effect of him not getting the attention from dad and he knew when he was gonna have kids he probably said to himself, I want to make sure my kid knows I'm there and I'm always by their side. And I think that's a, that's a it's, there's nothing but positive can come out of spending time with your kids as a father. I mean, and not just me as an outsider. I mean, I'm, I'm sure as fathers, there can't be anything more valuable to, to between you and your kids is the time spent. You know, one of the dilemmas that I find as a parent, and I'm curious if um, Edgar, you've had this or Rob and, you know, Eric, I'm sure you can imagine this, too. 
Um, I always, I, I do love spending time with my kids most of the time. You know, there's, everybody's going to have their moments where you're like, give me some space or whatever. But, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of guilt involved in being a parent. It, one of the things that, that has felt like a lot of pressure for me, and it's partly because I didn't have a, a father uh, from, you know, from birth, essentially, is I put a lot of pressure on myself to really be there for my kids. And as a result, I can feel guilty when I'm away from them. And I can also sometimes feel guilty when I'm with them, but not enjoying it as much as, as, as I could be. And one of the things that I do like to share with people is we have to take some pressure off of ourselves. This actually fits with what Rob was saying about, about freedom. Like, at least that's the way I was interpreting it, that you you were recognizing that our generation is prioritizing some individual freedom that we should get to continue living our lives in certain right. ways. And we do have to strike that balance. I'm, I'm curious how you guys have done it and whether, whether that, is that guilty f- feeling familiar to you or is that just because I'm Jewish? <laughs> uh, I'll, go, I'll go first, uh, Eric, on that. So, uh, and Edgar. So, interesting you say that so I, I I've, I've been I've been fortunate enough so I started my career in the NFL you know you work hard for about four to five months and pretty much you have the rest of the year off with the exception of some workouts and a practice right so I came out of the gate at 22 23 years old having a ton of time with my kids once I got hurt transitioned to corporate America I was going into the office things of that nature um a time away was was something that I wasn't used to. So it occurred for me that I wasn't spending enough time with my kids to your point, because I had a reference point where I had eight, nine months of the year, I'm with them all the time. Fast forward to, to the corporate America track where I've been working from home for the last 12 years. I'm with my kids literally every day. And if they see, when, they're not, when they're at school, that's the only time they don't see me and we're not together and in, in, in conversation with each other. I pick my daughter up from school, drop my son off, I'm very active, very involved on a daily basis. I never feel guilty about the time spent. There once was a time where I was working 80 hours a week and um, they were in adolescence and uh, being teenagers, doing what teenagers do. I left the company, I left the job, I left the role where I was on a fast track to executive leadership to to get my time back. And that's how I got to to California. So to your point, um, never any guilt on the, on the, time spent side, there was guilt on the lack of time spent side. And I made a lifestyle change, a whole life change, a career change, just to make sure I got that time back with them. Because there's, to me, there's nothing more important. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I make sure to do is, uh, this is just the way I think about things. I I, I think, well, what am I going to feel later? And I'm willing to put in the time now because I know later I mean, look, I love spending time with them a lot of the time, but I also, I go into overdrive. I spend a lot of time with them and I I drive hard to do the best job I can because eventually you can't get this time back, you know? And I want to look back and say, you know what? I really, I really maximize the time with these kids. And that, that's, that's a part that feels good to me. Edgar, what's your take on this? See, for me, it's much different, you know? Um, Rob, how old is the oldest? 22. 22. And then Dr. Dan, yours is what, seven? I got 12 and eight. 12, okay. So, like I said last week, um, I had my son when I was 18, like freshly 18, you know? So, That's I, a was whole just a kid, I was just a kid <laughs> myself. So, for me, it's a whole different scenario as you guys. Because even though my son now is 27 years old, you know? So, growing up, having a kid that, at that age, you know, which is interesting. And we're going to go back, Eric, to what you said, how parents, you know, back then there was more parents than there are now. And what, what what's the difference? But having a kid at that age, like, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So my son grew up in my household more like my little brother because my mother was his, you know, the, 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 the grandmother, you know, the, the role model. You know, he always saw my mom as his mom. You know, he was like my little brother instead. So it, it was it was hard. You know, um, his mother and I split when he was very young. He was two, still in my life, you know, a lot. You know, I saw him every day because li- we lived in the same building type. But, you know, so for me, it got to the point that we live that life apart, and I try to spend a lot of time with him as much time as I can. But you know, at the same time, we always 
you know, I'm, I was still trying to like build my life and become better and be better, you know. So he probably feels that I, I was neglecting him, you know. I didn't give him as much time as he needed, you know. But, you know, at that age, I, I was still trying to make money to to support and put food on the table for everyone. You know what I'm saying? I, so it, I can't relate with you guys because he's so old now, you know. He's a man now, so it's different. And But I can see where not being there as much as I should have has affected our relationship now to where but, we are now. But so it, how is, we, it is a key, it is a key lens that you'd have to see your, your fatherhood through, you know, it's a totally different thing. I mean, I was 34 when my first kid was born. Mm. I was almost twice the age that you were when wow. you had a kid. That's, yeah. that's crazy. And listen, I was, I was living in New York at the time. I lived in Brooklyn for 15 years People in, in Brooklyn, especially the, the city livers, they they tend to have kids around 35. It's like 35 to all the way up to 42, 43, 44. This is very normal. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. it, it just, I'm blown away. And this goes back to what Eric was saying about the statistics, how different it was. I mean, even, even the average statistics that you read, Eric, they're still shocking to me. Having lived in New York and knowing when people were having kids, I'm like, wait, you're telling me it went up, you know, only to like people who, what was it, 27 and they had already had one 27, kid. well, it was 25. In the late 80s, you were 25 and had 2.1 kids. Two kids, right? And, yeah. Two or more. Right. right. So, which means it probably got started at like 22. So, that is a significant shift. And yet, and this speaks to Rob's point, and I think that it needed to be rebalanced some. You know, we needed to we needed to actually have more of what we need for ourselves. And I'll tell you why. I mean, there's multiple reasons. But one of the reasons why I think it's so important is our parents generation. They I do think they gave up more of their personal freedom. But I think what came out of that is that that actually made them get more absent because they I think they were pissed. (laughs) I really think they were. (laughs) Mm-hmm. They, they just were like, that. I gave up everything for you and I'm going to go over here and be by myself. I, I <laughs> can see that. That doesn't sound very far-fetched. No wonder, no wonder I kept getting those stares. Now, now it's all making sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Mom, what are you staring at? Nothing. <laughs> but really, you know, it, it is, I, I think sacrifice is important, but it can come at a cost if it's not balanced outright. You know, and then there's the other side where I think people are thinking way too much about their their own needs. And and by the way, and I want to be clear about Zegger, I'm not talking about 18 year olds. That makes sense. But there are 40 year olds who they have kids and then they want to go, you know, live their own lives. Like I think too independently. I'm not meaning to criticize anybody, but we got to find a balance. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I see that more in this generation that. Uh, trying to be friends or like buddies or equals with your children. You know, I, I mean, I, I came from a generation where mothers would get insulted if you thought there was anybody but their mother. Now mothers get insulted if you don't think they're their sister or their cousin. They get insulted when they think you're the mother now. <laughs> and I'm like, that makes, what? You know, so, uh, I mean, that I don't understand. And maybe a, as parents raising kids in this generation, and I'm sure it, it has to do, obviously, with the change in culture and, you know, social media and the way kids grow up today. Maybe, maybe you, you could explain it to me because I don't understand uh, the desire to want to be your children's friend and not their parent. Because I don't think you can go back and forth very easily. One has to be established first. Mm. I think I do. Want, I, I have a take on it, but I don't want to jump in yet. I want to hear from you guys first. You said something, Dr. Dan, last week that really stuck with me, and it's, it's the knowing when to step in part, right? So I thought about, I had a chance to reflect on it because, you know, I looked at the sort of evolution of me as a parent and my relationship with each child, because there's four of them, there's multiple layers of complexity. Um, I think when they're early, when they're young, we, we teach them, they go, don't do this, don't do that, do do this, do do that. We, we reprimand, we model. Modeling is a thing that's consistent throughout all phases of, of the adult development uh, process or the development of a human being. You're always, mod- as, a, as, a, as a parent, you're always modeling. They're always watching what you do. Not always listening to everything you say, but they're watching what you do. And so you talk about balance. I think the knowing when to step in, 
You know, there, we, we've done a good job teaching, preaching, modeling. Now it's just like letting live, let, let them live, let them fall, let them stumble and knowing when to jump in and, and save them from themselves. And sometimes you let them, you know, bump their teeth off the ground and lose a few. It's that, it's that delicate balance I think we have to strike. And there's one more point that I make is we haven't covered this part because I think it's important for those who are listening, who are in relationships. To me, believe it or not, the kids come second to my wife. Believe it or not, my the, so as much time as I spend with my kids, I spend equal or more time with my wife because at some point, those little buggers are going to grow up and leave the nest. And I think a lot of divorce occurs in two phases. One, when, when the kids leave and when menopause happens. So that's probably a whole other show, but I just wanna make sure for the, for the dads who are watching, who are married, I'm not, when you hear me talk about all this time I spend with my kids, I wanna be responsible to say that I spend equal or more time with my wife because I don't wanna lose uh, that partnership and that connection with her because that really trumps the whole, that, that is the foundation of our family. Mm. It's interesting. Wow. And I think uh, lots of people would have takes on it in different directions. But actually, one of the, one of the things that I was hearing and listening to it, and, and Eric, you're, you're the guy who goes and gets the statistics for us and brings them to us. I would like to hear about divorce rates uh, at different ages because my theory is that the biggest time for divorce is actually when people have really little kids because it is extremely stressful. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's actually speaking to what you're saying, Rob. There's nothing that divides you more in, in a spousal relationship than babies. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't I mean to contradict what you're saying, but it's just, it, yeah. And by the way, you won't, you always hear, uh, you rarely hear anyone put anyone before their kids. Usually, I think 99 out of 100 people will always say, my kids come first. So for you to come out and be honest and say that your wife comes first, that just tells me that she's in the room right now. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm playing. I'm yeah. playing. I'm playing. I'm just she playing. She is right next to him. Like, <laughs> I'm just what playing. I told she you. Like, what mm -hmm. I told you. Who come first? I heard your podcast first? last week. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but but you know what? I, I think I think what you say is quite true, and I think and Dr. Dan, I, I am going to look up those stats, Dr. Dan, because I think when you do stop focusing on each other and you put all your focus on your kids, you have to fall out of love. I mean, you fall out of love if you don't pay attention to the person that you're in love with. So if you if it's all about the kids, and then you mm -hmm. forget why you fell in love with this person in the first place, and I'm sure when the kids are gone, you're like. Well, what the hell are we doing here? You know, what I mean? so and, I, I mean, I'm interested to look up those numbers, but it does make sense because even I don't have kids, but if I don't spend time with my wife, the relationship dies, and that can only be amplified when you have the not only the emotional baggage that children have to have, but the financial burden. It's not just the love and the emotion in raising a good human being. You have to support and nurture these people for a, a good long portion of their lives. And that means a financial sacrifice that I respect all parent, all parents that do it. So, I mean, that's mm. a lot. Nice. Uh, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, going back to Rob real quick on that question on, on how, I think it's like when two people have a kid, like you said, Dr. Dan, it divides, it's, it's hard because it takes away your lifestyle. You know, your life completely changes now. And it's, it's not about you two. Now it's about this little person as well. And, and a lot of pu couples, get that heat and they don't know how to you know they, they let the kid come in the way they're still great parents but they let the kid go in the way i've known a lot of couples who who the minute that the kids leave the house or college that's when they split up because that's it you know what i'm saying like i know couples i know right. men who are who are in relationships who are miserable because they want to be a great dad to their kids you know what i'm saying and that's a that's another whole different topic and it and it's crazy and it usually happens because if you want to be responsible dad you want to be good and you want to be there yeah but the minute they become empty nesters you're like okay you know i don't need to put up with this no more you know and that's why you see a lot of divorce rates so i do appreciate the fact that you said you put your wife first because at the end of the day that's how it all started you know what i'm saying your kids are always going to be your kids your kids no matter if you put them first second third or fourth they still your kids you know they still come they're still there so i really um appreciate that and then going back to what you said eric about why parents choose to be their kids friends um 
it comes to a point like if you're a father and you have a rocky relationship, my son and I have, uh, I mean, rocks, rocks, back and forth, back and forth, you know, back and forth. And, and I told you, I've tried it all. You know, I've been the dad. I've been the, the enforcer. I've been, I, and I've even tried the friend. You know what I'm saying? Cause, and then some, I, I believe, Eric, that some parents do this because they want to build that confidence with their kids where they think, oh, you know what? That is cool. You know, I'm, I could tell dad anything because dad is like my friend. You know what I'm saying? So mm. it, it could be a gift and a curse. It could be a gift and a curse. Cause, you know, it, it could work. But then at the same time, you lose that fatherly respect. But if I feel if if you know how to handle both of them well, where you still the, the father, but you should always be a friend at the same time. You know what I'm saying? You don't want your kid to be afraid if, if something happened to him to come up to you and share that with you because, oh, that, that is not going to understand this. So there's certain times that, yeah, you, sh- you shouldn't be a friend all the time. But as a father, I feel like you need to be your kid's friend, especially, especially when they get old. You know, kids, when they're young, you know, you got control. But once they get past that 15, 16, that's that's the age you're like, ooh, you know, like, ooh, like, I'm, you know. And then since we can't hit them, we can't hit them. We can't do what our parents did to us. So now it's a whole different story. So, yeah, it's crazy, man. Something for Dan to look forward to because he's still at twelve, so <laughs> still four years away from sixteen. Dan, you looking forward to that? I don't now, know how to make oh, that sound. Effect. All right, here's something I want to ask dads. Let me ask the dads because I, you know, your dad's. Um, well, you have a son, Edgar, so it's different. But maybe Dan, Dan you got daughters, correct? Mm-hmm. And I know Rob got daughters. So how hard is it for? How hard is it going to be for a guy to get past you? Uh, to go on that first date with your daughters, and it's, and it's especially hilarious. for Rob, because Rob, I'm assuming you have you have to have some kind of physique because you played in the NFL. So I want to see what type of dude thinks he's going to go to your door and ask your daughter out. But anyway, I just want to see what 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 does a guy have to get to get a first date with your daughter? Uh, well, I'll take this one, Rob, because uh, last week Rob talked. Rob broke the mold. He talked about how he's talked to his kids about sex and things like that. Well, that, well, I, I, it's about the guys coming to the door. It's not. I know. No, right, I know the I know. girl's prepared. She's she's good. She's prepared, but no, it it really is true. I've thought about this because it's like, what am I gonna do? I, I'm just gonna tell you the honest truth. It's gonna freak the hell out of me. I like there is not going to be any guy that is even remotely good enough for my girls. Like I, I'm, I'm just going to call it like it is. I'll do my best. What I'm going to do though, is hopefully my girls will find somebody that, that they really love and is really loving to them. That's the way I can find my access point to that person. But it's got, it has to come through the fact that it, if they can, if they make my daughters happy, then I can get on board with that guy. Otherwise, uh, you're just a guy with a dick. I'm not happy to see you here at all. <laughs> the way he said it. <laughs> He's just a guy with a dick. But, you know, I, I, I'll go ahead, Make Rob. sure to add that he had a dick. He's not just a guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a guy with a dick. A guy with a dick. No eunuch. <laughs> I think the more of a dirtbag you were when you were young and the things we did as we were young coming up and how we thought growing up, I think that determines how bad we will be when we have little girls. Because you, you've been there, you know? You know what a dirtbag you could have been at that age. And then, you know, you got a 15, 16-year-old comes home like that. I got a boyfriend. Dude, I'm, I'm going to be I'm gonna be a badass if that was my case. Oh, I had, yo, dude, look, I had a girlfriend when I was 16. I had a little girlfriend. I went to her father's, to the house to meet the father the first time. And he saw me walk in Puerto Rican, the guy. He was in Puerto Rico when I first went there to the house. I met the mom first. Then the, I walked in, and I don't know, I guess he thought I was white. You know, I guess he thought I didn't speak Spanish and I sat in a little living room and they had a little poodle and the dog was barking like loud and his friends were there. They were drinking and he said to his friends in Spanish, he thought I, he probably thought I didn't speak Spanish. But he said, man, if that dog was a pit bull, I would let him loose on him. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I was like, damn, this dude must have been really bad. I think the, I feel like the parents who are really really over possessive with their daughters the fathers who are really over possessive with the daughters it had something to do with the way you were brought up or the way you came up and the things you did that come back to haunt us I mean, there's, Rob. there's some truth to that um because you know all the tricks of the trade you know how slimy sleazy sneaky 
uh, manipulative you I was. I'm, I'm just going to make it personal, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm about mm -hmm. walking the walk. Mm -hmm. Listen, I was, um, I lost my virginity at the age of 12. And, um, you know, by the time I was married, I, I, God, this is going to go on YouTube. Uh, you know, I probably <laughs> had uh, like a like hundred partners, right? By, by, you know, 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So between 12 and 19, seven years, 100 people, right? And there's nothing cool about that. At the time, you couldn't tell me that I wasn't the man. But so to your point, you think, you think about how bad I was and I wasn't, um, I wasn't even a, a sport kind of guy. Like I wasn't a dog. It was never, nobody could say he, he dogged me out. I was the guy, I'm the worst kind of guy. The guy that girls fall in love with. The, the guy that they want to take home to daddy. And I have no intentions on being with these young ladies at that time beyond a very short period of time, right? See, Nine times out of 10, I had a girlfriend. See, that's what scares me is that a, a great guy like Rob was like that. <laughs> So then I'm like, oh man, I, I don't I like, you know, what scares guy's me here. that he said, and I wasn't a sports guy. It was just a hundred. Like what? Damn. Yeah, it Jesus. was, it was just, it was strictly based on penis. I wasn't even running very fast. It was all penis. <laughs> but Edgar, do you remember what kind of dog they had that they would have <laughs> sicked on you? I'm just curious. Dude, it remember? was a little, it was a little tiny poodle. The dog kept on barking uh, at me, barking they, at me. And he they told should have friends, sicked the poodle on you. If they yeah, really dude. wanted to make a statement. <laughs> Dude, the pool and, and it was it was so hard because he was a real Latino, real strong Latino like my father, you know. So he has a little girl, and he said, "Who's this little kid?" He made it really tough at first, but then he came around, you know. He 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 liked me more than the mom afterwards, but it was crazy. And thank God I don't have daughters, you know, like because because I, well, I don't know, I don't know what I, I mean, do. especially after Rob's admission. And Rob, you strike me as the type of guy you were you weren't a dog. That meant you were to a certain extent, to a certain level pretty honest with these women about what this was about. And Very. they continued to make a choice. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? That is a fact. So my, my, my signature line was, I have a girlfriend. Either you want me, I'm not leaving her. Either you want me or you don't. Your choice. Wow. And so at 15, 14, 15, 16 years old, girls are like, you know what? I, I've been dogged so much at this age. It's almost like these women are emotionally scarred after like two years of, you know, dating, right? They, they've been dogged and lied to so much that the honesty was so refreshing that they opted into the situation knowing that, full disclosure, I had a girlfriend and, and I wasn't leaving her. And, and, you know, we did what we did. It was, you know, fun. And that was that. So when they look back and they're, that they're 40 now and they're talking about their emotional pain body of dealing with men hopefully rob devon is not in their consciousness as somebody who did them wrong um <laughs> yeah, I, yeah i hope i hope there's not a voodoo doll somewhere just somewhere <laughs> sitting <laughs> you, you know what i realized with this Both conversation rob's wife yeah. left the room <laughs> yeah. you could see when she was there and when, yeah, well, when she was the difference my, when she's my there wife, and when she's not my wife come first Fellas, a hundred. My wife come first. But so did a hundred others. They came first too. Let me ask you guys this. Um, you know, we talk about breaking the mold. With what Rob just said, is he breaking the mold there or not? Because he's saying he's saying something that is in some ways kind of typical, but his level of ownership of it, very different. You don't hear that that much. I got to give well, you some, it, some props and I think I, th I think that's actually the only, you know what I mean? Like when you, it's, when you talk about the number, it's easy to, you know, to look at it in a certain way. But if you take it in context, it, it's, it's a consensual agreement to, between two people with honesty between them. And mm -hmm. both people are making a choice. So mm -hmm. you can't really, you know, if, there was, you know as, if it's, as long as it's consensual, there's nothing wrong with sex. And I think we need to stop actually attaching numbers to, to sex as if going beyond a certain number makes people a certain way. Because then it really stigmatizes sex. And that's why people get tight about it. We need to stop putting a number on it and just understand that we're all sexual and whether it's 10 or 100, as long as it's consensual and you're doing it with somebody that also consents into it and you're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the only thing I would add to it is, is, is just being in integrity, right? So if you're in a relationship with somebody and that contract, whether it's a marital contract or a boyfriend and girlfriend situation or a fiance, you're betrothed to be married, just 
be up front with that person as well. So where I did a good job, like everybody else was getting full disclosure, but my girlfriend was not. She didn't have a say in the matter. So as I look back in hindsight and I teach my boys, listen, man, if, if, if you have a girlfriend and you want to see other people, that is a conversation. You, maybe you should be asking yourself, why are you in this relationship so young? And if you can't, if you can't reconcile that in your mind, then don't bring somebody else along for a ride when you're not ready to be in a monogamous relationship. And I say the same thing to my daughter. Um, she's a little bit of a player. Probably but the, all, that, all, that, all the open communication she's had with me all these years. But, the, me, but me, this, is, this is one of okay. Go ahead, Edgar. No, no, go ahead, Doc. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this is one of the things that I liked about Rob right from the start is that you, you and I do think this breaks the mold in a certain way, you, you bring an honesty to things even with yourself. Hmm. And that is not not easy to do it but i think it is it's it's really the number one starting point for a good foundation for anything you have to you have to size up where you're at with things edgar what were you gonna say i, I was gonna i up. was gonna bring it back because uh we we geared <laughs> off but i was gonna bring i was gonna bring it back to why are more or less parents now and why are they older now than the than than back then you know, you think back then it was be because our parents were so busy and they were they were out there hustling and they gave us more freedom. There wasn't as much technology. So we well, were like kids. Uh, there and is one one reason, actually. And I want to go back because Rob made this point early on. Um, one of the factors playing into becoming a parent later, because I just looked at the stat, is more people are going to college. So they're in college and they're building themselves more before they enter parenthood. On the flip side of that, student loan debt. You walk out owing $100,000, they don't even have the money to start a family. So that also plays a, a role. As you said, Rob, financially, they got to pay back these bills. So th that has a lot to do with it. And you have to think culture. You know, I mean, you, you have to think culture. We, you know, uh, th there was a time, listen, a, a Puerto Rican with no kids, I should be stoned, according to mm -hmm. my family, okay? And, and Fordham and they, Road in the Bronx. Uh, right, I'm telling you, and I, you know, I didn't come from Riverdale in the Bronx. I was in the South Bronx. I was in the Bronx, Bronx, okay. And I had, I had the Puerto Rican family, the same typical for Puerto Rican family that Edgar came from, just old school. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, I'm, it, I'm sure it baffled them that I, I never came home with a kid. At some point, I'm pretty sure they thought I was gay because I didn't have a kid. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they thought these girls I was bringing home were beards because. My God, he's got long eyelashes and he tells jokes. He's got to be gay. You know, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that there were a lot of assumptions, you know, on why I, you know, I wasn't a father. Because there is, there is something in, inherent in just growing up. You think about being a parent, even as little kids. One of the first games you play in life is what? Mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. So you're already thinking about being a father since you're like three or four years old. So, is that still you, happening, you know, by the way? I don't know, Dr. Dan. Is that still happening? Do your daughters play mom and dad? And, you know, I mean, I don't have, I'm not around little kids like that, so I don't know. If that's yeah, well, I, I I mean, look, I, I Are you think... implying something, Edgar? Hold on one second. Are you <laughs> no, implying no, something? No, um, you know, I, I, Listen, I, I, that's I don't a whole different speak English. <laughs> We're going to get into walking the walk, but we don't want to hear that one. Uh, so, uh, listen, I, here's an interesting thing. I mean, I know we talk about gender norms and how we want to offer boys and girls the same things a lot of times, but there are times where their natures just come out. I mean, I have two girls and they are girls. They're like, they're just girl girls all the way. And that includes things like playing house, basically, you know, mm -hmm. talking about family stuff. I got two nephews. They weren't doing that. That's not what they were doing at all. They, they were just doing totally everything. I mean, I don't know. We just happened to maybe end up being very gender stereotyped, but I don't think I don't think kids have changed much. I think what has changed more is um, an awareness of the struggle. It actually partially comes from psychology. We talk about these things more, and by talking about it, it changes the game. Now we're now we're starting to think about it. We're starting to think like, well, what really is okay? Why do I do this? Instead of just being like, I do this, I do this, I do this, and like that's something I give you credit for, Eric, in terms of you. You thought for yourself. You weren't going to make a decision just based yeah. on what everybody and else God, You know, God, it should be okay to not be a father. It is mm -hmm. not, it should not be a decision entered lightly. I am sorry, especially as, as this generation just continues to evolve. It's okay to not be a father. If you want to be a father, fantastic. Yeah. Be the best father you can. But if you're not a father, it's okay. For whatever reason, you're not a father. 
it's okay because you don't need to be a father to be a man, okay? You Thanks. need to be a man to be a father, but you don't need to be a father to be a man. And I just want to make that very clear. That's Thanks. a good point. Now, guys, I'm just I'm noticing the time. I, oh, yeah. I want to I want to see do do we want to walk the walk? We didn't have a plan for anybody specific to walk the walk, but I think the idea that we had was that each of us could talk about a situation um, just that's on our mind. You know, uh, sometimes walking the walk is not going to be a deep, dark thing. It can be about just a situation that you're running into. But actually, I, I was thinking about last week and wondering, because uh, I thought that was an incredibly deep discussion. It certainly was for me. And it left me thinking a lot about a lot of things. So I was thinking about, well, what did I do this week in parenting? <laughs> you know, like, but I also was wondering, how did it impact you guys? Because we, we had some pretty deep discussions about that. Mm. <clears throat> you want me to go first? Uh, so I guess this, this is this will be like a walk in the walk, you know? So um, if you're listening for the first time or viewing for the first time, walk in the walk is a segment where we like to express ourselves, get something off our chest, you know, share something that's bothering us. And um, this week we actually, like, like you said, we spoke about it and I think we should actually you know, um, each share something about being a father. And like I said earlier, I, I became a father very young. My, my son and I, you know, we were, were distant. We were close and distant at the same time. To this day, and Rob knows this because we talk about this on our walks, um, I'm at a point with my son right now, and this is, the, I'm, gonna, I'm asking you this, Diane, for, 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 for help on this because I'm at a point with my son right now that, I feel like it's just a lot of manipulation. Like I feel like he he manipulates me. He he makes me feel guilty for for being absent, for not being there. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of fathers out there who feel just like me, or or, or, or not not necessarily so young when your kids are so young, but it gets to a point that once they hit that certain age. For my son, it was like 15, 15, 16. He started. Pss, and sucking his teeth and and like you know like oh now he's a little tough guy, and it and it gets to the point that to this day now I feel like the relationship we have is he only calls me when he needs me. You know, and, and it sucks and it sucks and it, and it, and, it, and and as much as I want to try and reach out and change like you told me Eric and I will do have this conversation with him next month when I go to New York and see him face to face. So I'm gonna do it face to face. But as much as I want to try, I feel like I want to look for him. And, and, and it's like I look and then it's like, boop, can you hook me up with this? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? And it gets to the point that I'm just mad. I'm just mad because I'm like, dude, what am I, your ATM? What am I? Do you only call when you need me? Like, why don't you just call me when you, when you don't need something? You know, and this is my my constant battle with him. You know, I, I say, call me when you when you don't need me at all and just call and ask how mm. you doing. So what I'm going through now with him is that I feel that that's the only time he, he actually calls when he needs something from me. And then if I don't do it, then he knows how to make me feel guilty. You know what I'm saying? Like, he'll he'll shoot me a text asking me for something, and then I'll be like, come on, bro. Because automatically, you know, it just goes right back to like, again? Really? You know, when you're going to get shit together? And, you know, I become, a, I become that father, and it shuts him down, and then he'll throw something at me that eventually... It'll mess me up in the head. And no matter how much I fight, at the end of the day, I still fold and I still give in. And he still gets what he wants. So when it gets to a relationship like that, like, how do you how do you stop that? You know, how, how do you what would you tell me, Dr. Dan, for me to, you know, fix my relationship with my son right now when it when it's gotten to that point? You All know? right. So I'm going to I'm going to jump back to something that I said last week. Um. You know, it's funny because I asked you guys, well, like, how how was your week with parenting? And then I realized, Edgar, you've been moving all week. Like, there, there'd be no way you had to implement any of this. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, but no. but I do think I want to I want to throw out the suggestion again that actually I want to make a new new point and return to something. The new point is this: we are always changing. We think we're the same. We think we're always the same, but we are not. We're, we're in a different moment every single moment. So try not to get too caught up in, I would say try not to get too caught up in the idea that your relationship is this way. 
Because actually, a lot of times you think it's that way, but you don't realize at other moments you don't feel that way. So uh, now I'm not saying that's true for you, Edgar. Maybe you always feel that and that would be a different thing. But just a, a tip for everybody out there, don't get too caught up in any given moment. Try to see the, the bigger picture of it. Now, if there is a bigger picture thing, though, this is the thing that returns to last week. And I was curious if, if anybody got to think about this or if it you know was useful to them. But for me, it's all about the listening. We, we talked about the listening, you know, like, so people have a tendency when there's a problem to want to say, I need you to listen to me. <laughs> but that's not the way problems get solved. The way problems get solved is we take a step back and say, tell me what's happening with, with true openness. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do when you're mad at somebody. It's hard to do when there's a long history. I mean, we, you know, I was struck by what you said, Rob, about divorce actually. And then Edgar actually in some ways kind of made the link between what I was saying, the stress of having babies and then the empty nester thing. They're not disconnected by the time, by the time those people who are having such struggle with babies get to be empty nesters. They're like, get out of my face. You know, like it, they're not disconnected tension. And the same is true whether you're talking about your wife or your kids. I think I think what you want to do is try to focus on the listening and try to recognize if you can't do it in that moment, that's okay. Maybe that's not the moment that you can do it right now. But remember, we're not always the same. You'll have better mm-hmm. moments. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll have time well, when you can I'm listen. sorry, Rob. After ahead, last Rob. week, right... I mean, I mean, I was moving and I had so much in my head and, but that's one thing that I picked up from last week, you know, like, like, okay, I guess as a father, I get mad, you know, you want them to do better, you know? And it's like, like, dude, when you're going to change the pattern, like when, when you're going to do, you know, so I am looking forward to listening more. I am looking forward to sitting down face to face and asking him the question of, dude, what do you want from me? You know, because I, I, I really I really don't know at this point, you know. So from last week, and I thank you for that, and I thank you for what you just said now, because I am looking forward to m- listening more. Because I feel and I realize that I didn't listen. I didn't listen to him. You know what I'm saying? Because the minute he told me something, it's like whenever, whenever, when, when, when it's like a trigger. It's a, it's a trigger. He was a trigger. The minute I hear something, it triggers, boom, I'm lost. Just like I trigger him. So we're both triggering each other. It's like, let's see who could pull the trigger first. And then boom, 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 boom. And that's how we go back at each other. So we're not listening to each other. We're not, you know. So I am definitely looking forward to listening more and and building that, you know, a better relationship with him. He's a good kid. I love him to death. But, you know, at the end of the day, I I don't know. I think the fact that I had so young and I wasn't, you know, that role model that you're you're supposed to be as a father because I was just a kid myself, it changed a lot. This this is one thing I hope that, because I I hear what you're saying and I think think your regret of the past relationship being what it was is it might be affecting your ability to build a new relationship just based on the who the two of you men are as men now. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, right. yes, you have that relate. Yes, you. It wasn't the. It wasn't what you wanted. It wasn't ideal. It. It did. You know, you could have done more if you were older. Yet, but blah blah blah. I understand it. I'm not taking nothing away from it. But those relationships did matter to him, and I. But they shouldn't count in the relationship that you're going to build with this man, who he is today. As two men, you raised a good man. You know that. He may mm-hmm. only. He may hit you up for money. He may not have the career. Uh, uh, like a, a big corporate 500 dude. But he's a good man. He tries. He works hard. I know you respect him as a man. And I think that's the relationship you need to build. You have a foundation in family and history that will never go away, both of pain and love. But you cannot use any of that in building this new relationship. And that means starting from zero. Starting from zero. Starting from the beginning. I'm Edgar. This is who I am. I love that point, Eric. Actually, it's a way to listen. A a way Mm -hmm. to listen is to say... I'm starting from zero, no matter what's happening. And I, and I do that over and over with my kids. I, I don't even think, like, l- I have a really good relationship with both my kids right now and have historically. But I don't really consider that, like, money in the bank that I can now stop listening because they're going to change and I'm going to change and I have to keep listening. And I love that idea, Eric, of let's start from zero. 
Start and, over. And, and know that you can build something good. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you, brother. Oh, man, this is good. Golly, this is good, guys. Um, I would add one thing, Edgar, because I actually, or another perspective, I, I actually believe that when reconciling primordial relationships, you know, mommy, daddy, kids, I think that we, we have to go below zero to get to the root. I think what I'm hearing is that you and your son are suffering from the same thing. Let me explain. You suffer from personal disappointment, disappointment in the father that you was and was not. Mm -hmm. And you're disappointed in your son for the way he turned out. Your son suffers from disappointment in the relationship that he has with his father, the, the, the dad that you were and were not to him. And he's also disappointed in himself because he believes that he should be further in life at this point. And he believes that he should be further in his life in life at this point if he had a better dad or better upbringing, right? So you you two are a freaking mirror, staring one another in the an eye in the mm -hmm. eye, going to war, not knowing how similar you actually are. And so what I do for transformation as a framework is I gotta go to the root of the pain, the root of Edgar's pain in this scenario is the dad that he wasn't. To Eric's point, the first thing I would do is forgive myself. Forgive myself for being a father at 18 years old and not knowing my way. It happened. The blessing is that there's a 14 trillion and one chance that a baby will be born and, and two people doing the deed and you have a son. He is a miracle. He is by definition the best of the best of the sperm, the best of the best of the egg. And he's here still to this day. I would begin with a little humility and gratitude and forgiveness with self. Then I would share that with him. Son, I know you don't know this. Maybe you can't hear it, but you have no idea how much regret, how much I beat myself, how much shame and guilt I have about who I was and was not for you. And I deflect, I reflect, I pour, I transport that disappointment on you and i apologize for it i realize that the incompleteness in me is coming out in my relationship with you i'm blaming you for who i wasn't mm. and i apologize for that and this is what i want to design moving forward because whatever i design from from that space i'm responsible for how my kid reacts and responds to the dad that i designed myself to be that's that's on them. Their response to that is, is on them. But who I say I am and who I show up as consistently is on me. I can control that, right? Just like you taught me to go and reconcile with my daughter, even though I was mad as hell at her and disappointed, I was on it. I was really on it with myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. And I want to add one thing that I, I heard you say, Rob, that I think is really important. It's amazing how, how much people forget what a miracle it is that anybody exists at all. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's insane. We're floating on a rock in space. <laughs> the, on, the odds of any one person, that one sperm, that one egg coming together, them surviving. And <sighs> I, that's a way that we could learn to be less hard on ourselves is to remember like, listen, it's not easy being a human being. Edgar, you, you did a lot of good things. I, I know, I know you did cause I know you. Mm hmm. We're all going to have messed up things uh, or do things that we wish we could have done differently. I certainly feel that way. But I think uh, Rob's hitting the nail on the head about the fact that you, you want to forgive yourself. And then I think Eric's hitting the nail on the head about you have a chance always to start over again, which doesn't mean start over again because everything was bad. It's just a new way of looking at it as, you know, we could start over and have something good here. And I think if we can remember that global perspective of how, what a miracle it is that any of us are here at all, we could start being nicer to each other. It's amazing how people forget that they're driving in their cars. They get road rage. They forget all that. Go ahead. Eric. Mm -hmm. What was that stat? You said that, that astronomical stat about the chances of conceiving. What was that number again? When, like what 14, was you? 14 trillion and one trillion with a T. Doesn't that t doesn't that even make it even more amazing at what I've been able to accomplish? 
That's Am right. I not getting the credit? I've been avoiding trillions and trillions of situations, yo. Am Trillion. I not getting any love here? Sorry. That's funny. I, just, I was just thinking about that. And you know what, Edgar? You know, um, I, I guess my next question for you would be, has he been watching this podcast? Well, if, you know, if he has, has he heard what you've been saying? Because the conversation has already been started. And if he, if he is watching the show, this episode will definitely be... I would look at it as, as a foundation to start a conversation and make it less awkward because you don't have to start the conversation in person, but you could sure finish it in person. Oh, no, yeah. I've definitely sent him the link. He told me he checked out a few of them. I don't I don't really, you know, he hasn't called me in specific details. When someone tells me they checked out the podcast, I expect them to say something that was mentioned in it. Oh, I saw it. What you heard? I, I saw it. It was good. It was good. You, you, you guys had Rob. Rob was there, you know? But... um. <laughs> I, I definitely want to forward this podcast to him. And it's crazy. And I want the listeners and viewers to know that this week we didn't have a walk in the walk. This week no one was going to walk the walk. We were just going to express something, you know. And it's, and that conversation just led me to share that with you guys. So it's basically like I walked the walk. And I walked the walk. And thank you, Eric. Thank you for your advice. Rob, thank you for your advice. And Dr. Dam, I mean, I, I love you brothers for it. You know what I'm saying? And it's great how, and I want the viewers to see how easy it could be just out of a simple conversation, you just share something that's bothering you inside, and then suddenly out of nowhere, you have someone like Eric who is not a dad, but meanwhile could give you the fucking best advice ever. You know what I'm saying? Which is, you know, which is great. So you definitely do not need to feel left out of this conversation because you're not a dad. But at the end of the day, you're listening and and you know, you give, give great advice. And like you said, Rob, it's true. I do beat myself for that. Mm. I do, I, I yeah, the, the the father that I wasn't is the reason why I think I am like that today. So yeah, I am looking forward to 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 making this better with him, you know, and hopefully, yo, I hopefully have him on the podcast one day and hopefully we could, you know, work this beef out together and speak speak about it and and become better men. And yeah, I just want to thank you guys, man. That was great. That was great. I can't wait to go back and see the podcast because what's said on here sometimes my ADD kicks in so much and we speak so much. It's like Rob will say something. Like, okay, I got something to say. And then by the time he's done, I'm like, oh, fuck, I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, Dr. <laughs> Dan, you say it now. And then it's like, then you talk and then I remember and it's like, boom. So I love to always go back and view the podcast because it is educational. We're having fun. We're talking about deep shit. We hear sharing, you know, spilling our, 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 our you know, our hearts out to, 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 to viewers who we don't even know. But at the end of the day, we could help them. We could help one guy out there that's probably going through the same thing we're going through. And I want the viewers and listeners to know that, yo, if you're going through this, if, you, if you're a father and you got issues, man, please comment down below. You know, send us an email. S send us your, your, your questions, your concerns. How can you be a better dad? What, what are you doing wrong from listening to this and viewing this? What can you do wrong? If you have any questions for Dr. Dan, for any of us, man, send them in and let's start like connecting with each other and talking more because I believe that's the only way we're going to ever help each other if we start spreading the word and getting out there. So thank you, brothers. Thank you for this. I appreciate you. Well, and, thank by the you, way, I just got to say, uh, uh, Rob, what you said was, it was uh, very eloquent. Point. And I just love that ev at least in both episode episodes you've been a part of us, you've at least used one word where I said, what? Like a primordial? You use right. the word primordial? <laughs> awesome. I, I haven't heard that word in so long. No, but Eric, I hate to do this to you. It's primordial. Oh, there yeah. you go. Primordial. <laughs> I, did, I, I, didn't didn't know know I hate to do this to you. I hate to do this to you, both of you. Primordial. I don't even know primordial. what you're talking about. I don't even know what that I, word I, is. I was like, oh my God, what the hell? What? I, I heard that in like a, like, a, like a Viking movie in the 80s. So I just <laughs> want to say thank you for making me have to think and learn something new today. I I'm feel like I gotta ask, stuff. what is primordial? Because I'm pretty sure there's some people listening to this. Like, I don't even know like what that something is. Something from like a primitive era, right? I mean, the context clues. It's you know, it, it it is that it is that 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 nature and nurture that relationship with with mom and dad. That is, uh, you know, when we if we really do the math on all of our messed upness, it 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 start. We we would all start with my, our relationship with our parents, and uh, because they really mm -hmm. do set the tone for our self image, who we believe we are, the world our worldview, right? Especially in our, our, our zero to seven um, time span. So when I look there, that's when I start doing my work as a human. I, I got the most transformation with reconciling some of the some of the rifts, if you will, or beefs as you call it, Edgar, with my mom and dad. Um, and you said to the listeners, I will say this, 
tell the truth, man. We can't fix a lie, too, especially mm-hmm. us guys. We're, we're too busy trying to look good and be good. You cannot fix a lie. I would frame it this way. If you have a big ego like I did and you need to soften it, kill it, you know, squash it. Instead of saying, what am I doing that's wrong? Who am I being that's wrong? It's what's not working in my life or not working as well as I would like it to work. Because then, then it's not personal. It kind of takes the sting out of it. It's like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a continuous improvement kind of person. I just want to improve this, not I'm wrong. When I'm wrong, the defenses come up, you get angry, you get shameful, you get, you get, you know, all these sort of negative vibrational frequencies. And so what's not working? Or what's not working as well as I like it. But, you know, you know, another way of thinking about what you just said, Rob, is that you and I, and I really I think you do a great job of this just from what I hear in general. You're you have a conversation with yourself. You keep the dialogue going with yourself. And mm. what I was thinking about with what, you know, we'll wrap up on this, guys. But um, what Edgar was basically saying or what I saw in Edgar was he did not expect to have this conversation. Mm. He wasn't planning to walk the walk. But the premise of this podcast really does work and we just saw it in action because it feels to me like you had something heavy weighing on your heart and you almost didn't even totally know it was there Mm -hmm. until we started discussing it. Then it came out. You bravely stepped up to the plate. You started talking about it. And I can tell you, like, it felt like your whole persona kind of shifted when that happened. Uh, I saw you feel like, oh, yeah, talking really does... (laughs) It was as you started doing it, but it was, it was beautiful to see. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And I just, I I tell people, man, not everyone is going to be your person. Not everyone is going to listen to you the way you want them to. And it's okay. It's okay. If they don't listen to you, man, find someone else. There's always someone there that's willing to listen and, and be that person for you. But I'm glad that I got this circle with you guys where I could feel comfortable like that, you know? And I want the viewers to know and listeners that, yo, we could joke around. We could laugh. We could joke. And at the same, at the same time, we could still talk deep shit and, and, and get to be better. Because my experiences could be helping some of you out there listening. They're like, wow, wait a second. I'm, I'm rocking the same boat as this dude right now, you know? And Rob's advice will be like, boom. So... Yeah, thank you. I know once this is over uh, and I go back to the real world, definitely next week ask me how this impacted me, Dr. Dan, because definitely now I'm going to think about it even more, you know, and how, you know, how to how to come about it, how to change it, how to be a better man, because that's what we're here to do, to just be better men. So thank you, brothers. I appreciate you, man. I really, really do appreciate you, um, Rob. We're definitely on for a walk on Saturday because this is what we and Rob do. And if anyone is listening and you live in the L.A. area, because I'm in L.A., uh, on Saturday mornings, we do brotherhood hikes. Rob and I hit me up, send me a message on Instagram if you want to join us and and talk to us and hang out with us. Unless you're creepy, we don't want that. But listen, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'm out. But if but if you feel, he said I'm out. But I feel like those walks, Rob, mean the, the other than this, other than we doing this podcast every week. Those walk on Saturdays is where I so we do this, and then on Saturdays it's like boom. And mm-hmm. for the past month and a half, Rob have been Rob and I have been talking about this parenting and and the differences and and my angers and and it's beautiful when you can find someone to really be, you know, not to lie. Stop, stop lying, dude. Stop trying to pretend like you're the best dad in the world. Yo, my son this and my son that. When you know deep down inside the connection is not right and something's not going right, stop, stop trying to. To hide, cover the sun with one hand, bro. Be yourself. If you've messed up, you messed up. Talk about it. Hopefully, someone could give you some good advice. Hopefully, just talking about it will make you feel better. So, thank you, brothers. Thank you. Feel the same Thanks, way about Edgar. you, Edgar. We love you, bro. Absolutely. You, bro. Um, and well, that's right, another ta- thing. That's another break in the mold. Uh, another <laughs> break in the mold that we need to talk about. About the what? love word is not thrown around as much as women throw it around. Women, I love you, girl. I love you. I love you. I love you. Why is it so hard for a man to tell another man that I love you? You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I talk to Eric. I talk to Eric all the time, and we just recently started doing this right before this podcast when I went through my all my craziness last year. That Eric was there for me the most. It's crazy how I talk to Eric now, and at the end of the conversation, bro, I love you, bro, and I could say it proudly. I don't care. I love you, bro. So I, I love you, brothers. I love you, brothers, and fellas, stop fucking acting like. So macho, man, you know, appreciate the brothers in your life. Appreciate the men who are there for you and help you out and look out for you. Those are the brothers that you should def- definitely 
let them know I love you. Because why wait until they're gone to say, man, I love that dude. When I'm I right love- here and you could tell me that shit now. So break that mold. I love that point. Love being here with you guys, and uh, and I love you. Uh, I'm saying it to you. Nice. You guys, you guys are the best. All right, I'll take us out as usual. There you go, Dr. Dan. Go ahead. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and we will get back to you personally. Boom, brothers in arms. Primordial. <laughs> 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 Ha <laughs> 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 <laughs>